let's welcome Pedro Holanda for his talk on DuckDB and a, man a magnificent uh, snake duck. <laughs> yeah, you guys can be surprised at anything you can find as a rubber duck these days, you know. All right, so uh, I'm Pedro Holanda. Um, I am one of the main contributors of the DuckDB project, which is an open source uh, database system. And also I'm the COO of um, DuckDB Labs. And today I'm going to be talking a little bit about how uh, DuckDB can bring analytical SQL power directly into your Python shell. So to give you a little bit of an idea of uh, how this talks look like, I'm going to start with what is DuckDB. So you got, I'm here talking about one more database system. I'm going to motivate you guys that we actually needed to do one more database system. The other ones didn't solve the problems we had. Uh, and then I'm going to go over the main characteristics of DuckDB, so what actually makes it special. Uh, then I'm going to go over DuckDB in the Python land, so how DuckDB integrates in the Python ecosystem. Gonna go, I'm going to do a little demo. Uh, the basic idea is that we're going to use the infamous uh, New York City uh, taxi data sets, and we're going to try to do some um, estimation of uh, fare costs. And we're going to use like DuckDB, Pandas, and PySpark just to see a couple of the differences of the things I'm going to be uh, talking over. And then some summary of the talk. So what is DuckDB? Well, DuckDB was actually uh, born at CWI, which is the Research Center of Mathematics and Computer Science in the Netherlands. And what we actually had there is that a lot of the projects, the PhD student projects, the master projects, they are very data science-y. So usually you have a data science problem and you want to throw a database management system at a data science problem because you're handling data. So initially we were like, okay, we can probably use a database server, uh, use a database connection, and then just transfer the data from the relational database to your Python uh, terminal, for example, right? Like where your analytical tools are. And it turns out that's quite a bad idea because you are transferring a lot of data. So that's pretty costly. And then we're like, okay, this is really not solving our problem. Can we draw inspiration from somewhere else? And then, of course, there's SQLite, the most famous database out there, at least the most used one. Uh, and it has a quite a nice property, uh, which is being an embedded database system. Being embedded database system, it means it can run inside your Python process. So you can eliminate this data transfer cost. Uh, SQLite comes with one uh, design decision that is a transactional database, so it's actually super optimized for uh, small updates, but it's not really optimized for analytics. Uh, so we kind of wanted to do SQLite in terms of like being easy to use and eliminating this data transfer cost, but focusing on analyti analytical queries. Um, and that's kind of how DuckDB was born, and that's also why we frame it as a SQLite for analytics. Uh, it also has like a very simple installation, so if you think about Python, you just do a beep saw and you're good. Since it's embedded, there's no server management, so let's say you just want to, I don't know, query a parquet file, two lines of code, you can already query it. Like there's no starting your server, there's no uh, schema creation, the schema is inferred from the object, so it's very easy, very fast, and we also <laughs> really focus on this fast transfer between uh, analytical uh, languages and their tools, like in Python R to DuckDB. Uh, DuckDB is currently uh, in pre-release. Uh, I think the last version we released was 0 0.6, 0 0.7 is coming up soon. Uh, and in the web page there's like a little bit more details about uh, all, all the things that are in each release. All right, so I'm gonna go over some of the main characteristics of DuckDB, uh, particularly like the columnar data storage, uh, a little bit about compression. I'm gonna talk about vectorized execution engines. So these are all like core database stuff. Actually, talking about vectorized execution engine, it's a bit, uh, it's gonna be difficult because uh, Professor Bonks is here and he actually created that, so I'll try to uh, do it correctly. <laughs> uh, bit of, a little bit about end-to-end -end query optimization, parallelism, and beyond memory execution. So, color data storage. Well, there's basically two ways that you can do it. One is a row store or a scone store. As an example of row store, we have SQLites. And the whole thing about the, the, the whole idea is that you're storing your data consecutively in, in memory uh, per row. So that basically means that if you want to fetch an individual row, that's very cheap because it's contiguous in memory. However, uh, you always have to fetch all the columns. So analytical queries, usually you have very wide tables, but you just want to really get a couple of these uh, columns. So what if you only want to use a field? So in this example, 
what if you just are interested in the price of a product, but not the stars it's sold, right? Um, in, in a column store, you actually uh, have your layout that the data of the column is consecutively in memory. So if you want to access just a couple columns, you can actually have immense savings on disk I.O. and memory bandwidth. Uh, so that's why this type of format is really optimized for analytics. So to give you a more concrete example, let's say that we have a one terabyte uh, table with 100 columns. Um, for simplicity, let's say all the columns have the same size, and we just require five columns off the table in our analytical query. So in a row store like SQLite, reading this whole table, uh, if you have a disk with around 100 megabytes per second, it will take you three hours. If you were using a column store model, which is what Pandas and DuckDB does, for example, reading these five columns uh, from disk takes you eight minutes. So there's a huge improvement by just uh, setting up the correct storage formats for your workload. Uh, compression. Well, I'm not going to go into a lot of detail about the compression algorithms that uh, we implement in DuckDB, uh, but what I can tell you is because of the, having a column store, you, you're going to have your data from your column uh, continuously in memory, which gives you a very good advantage to compressing it because usually the data from the same column is somewhat similar. So you can apply uh, cool things like RLE, uh, FS, FSSC and CHIMP for uh, floating point numbers. Oh, sorry, CHIMP for floating point numbers, FSSC for strings. So you can start applying like all these algorithms and really decrease the size of your data. So in this table here, we actually have, a, uh, I think this is from one year ago, one year and a half, um, 0.2.8 from DuckDB. We had no compression at that point. And then a year and a half, uh, half later, we actually managed to implement all these things, which got us five times better compression, like Nitin, for example, 3.18 better compression in um, the taxi data set that I'm going to be using later. And why is compression so important? Well, if we go back again to the same example where we're reading our five columns, and it was costing us to read them from disk eight minutes because of the, the storage formats, if we compress these columns, we suddenly don't have to read 50 gigabytes anymore, right? You read less. And then, if, of course, you apply like the best case from what, what I showed you from the last table, five times, the error increases the, the cost to one, point, one minute and 40 seconds. So execution. Well, uh, there, there's three ways of uh, doing uh, query execution. There's actually one more, but it's not in the slides. Uh, but SQLite uses a tuple at a time processing, which means that you process one row at a time. Pandas uses column at a time processing, which means that you process one column at a time. InductDB uses kind of like a mix of the both, which is a technique developed uh, by Peter, uh, the vectorized processing where you process batches of a column at a time. So basically the tuple at a time model from SQLite, it was optimized for a time where computers didn't have a lot of memory. There, there was low memory uh, to be used because you only need to really keep one row in memory throughout your whole query plan. Um, so the memory was expensive, that's what you could do, but this comes with a high CPU overhead per tuple because you're constantly resetting your caches. You don't have any uh, cache conscious algorithm running that piece of data up to the production of your query results. If you go to the column at a time, which is what Pandas uses, this already brings like better CPU utilization, it allows for SIMD, uh, but it comes with the cost of materializing large intermediates in memory. Uh, it basically means that you need the whole column in memory at that point to process for that operator. And of course, the intermediates can be gigabytes each, so that's pretty problematic when the data sizes are large. And that's why you see, for example, that Pandas, if your data doesn't fit in memory, what does it happen? It crashes. Um, and then if you go to uh, the vectorized query processing, it's actually uh, optimized for CPU cache locality. You can do same instructions, pipelining. And the whole idea is that your intermediates are actually going to fit here in a L1 cache. Uh, so basically, you're going to be paying this latency of one nanosecond to be accessing your data throughout your query plan instead of paying the latency of a main memory, which is also the case of a colonial database, which is 100 nanoseconds. It seems like a small difference, but when you're constantly executing this, this really becomes a, a bottleneck. End-to-end um, -end query optimization is, of course, something that we have in DuckDB. So we have stuff like expression rewriting, join ordering, subquery flattening, filtering, projection pushdown, which is a bit more uh, simple, but it's extremely important and brings a, a huge difference in the cost of a query. 
So here's an example of a projection pushdown. Let's say you have a table with five columns, A, B, C, D, E, and you want to run a query, that's pretty small, but uh, the query is like it selects minimum from, uh, the, from column A, where there's a filter in column A saying that column A is bigger than zero and you group by B. So the whole point of this, the, this query is that you're only using two columns of the table, right? So what the DuckDB optimizer will do is like, okay, in the scanner, I know I don't need all the columns, I just need A and B, and you just don't have to read the other ones. If you do the same one in Pandas, for example, you can apply your filter, and then you have the filter, the group by, the aggregator, but at the time you're doing this filter, you're still filtering all the other columns you're not gonna be using in your query. Of course, you can manually make this optimization, but it's pretty nice that the database system can do that for you. Um, of course, DuckDB also has automatic parallelism and beyond memory execution. So DuckDB has parallel versions of uh, most of its operators. I think mo all of our scanners, uh, including uh, with insertion order preservation of parallelized now, aggregations, joins. Uh, Pandas, for example, only supports single-threaded execution. Uh, we all have like pretty good laptops these days, right? So it's a shame if you cannot really take advantage of parallelism. And DuckDB, again, uh, supports the execution of data that does not fit in memory. It's kind of the never give up, never surrender approach. It's like, we're gonna execute this query. Uh, we try to always have graceful degradation also that it just doesn't suddenly crash in performance. And the whole goal is really to never crash uh, and always execute the query. All right, so a little bit about DuckDB in the Python lens. Uh, basically, we have a, an API, it's a DB API 2.0 compliant, so very similar to what SQLite has, for example, you can create a connection and you can start executing queries. But we also wanted to have something similar to the data frame API. That still could, people that can't come from Pandas, for example, could still have something familiar to work on. So here in this example, you can also create a connection. You can create this relation, which kind of looks like a data frame. It's just pointed to a table. You can do a show to inspect uh, what the table is inside, and you can apply, for example, chain, these chaining operators, right? Like a filter, a projection. So in the end, this is all lazily executed. Um, and this also allows you to take advantage of the optimizer of DuckDB, even if you do the, the chaining operations. Um, of course, I talked to you about a memory uh, transfer. Uh, so we were very careful as well into being very integrated with these uh, very common libraries in uh, Python. So with Pandas and PyArrow, for example, what we actually do is that in the end for Pandas, the, the columns are usually NumPy arrows, which turns out they are C vectors, which turns out that's also kind of what we use. So with a little bit of makeup in the metadata, we can just directly read them. And they're all in the same process, right? So we have access to that piece of memory, which in, in the end means that you can actually access the data from Pandas in DuckDB without paying any transfer costs, at least constant transfer costs just for doing the, the metadata makeup, let's say. And it's the same thing with PyArrow. We also have a, what we call zero copy, so we can read uh, error objects and output error objects without any extra cost. Uh, with NumPy, we also support SQL Alchemy, and in IBIS, we're actually the default uh, backend from them, I think, since uh, six months ago. Um, a little bit of usage. So, as you can see, this is our, our PyPy um, download counts. Uh, the Python library is actually our most downloaded API. We have APIs for also all sorts of languages. Um, and you can see that in the last month we had like 900,000 downloads, so there are a lot of people that are trying out uh, and using DuckDB in their Python scripts. So now is the demo time. Let me get this. All right, this looks like you can see. So this is just installing DuckDB, PySpark, and uh, uh, getting our yellow trip data data set. I already executed this, so we didn't have to wait. Just importing the stuff we're gonna be using. And here is just like getting a connection from DuckDB, getting a, creating a relation that's just, uh, okay, we're gonna, as a parquet file, DuckDB can read parquet files, and then you can just print to inspect what's out there, right? So if we run this, we can see like, okay, these are the columns we have, we have vendor ID, we have pickup dates time, passenger counts, we have the types of the columns. You can also have a, a little result preview to have an idea of what your data looks like, so 
I think this data set has about like 20 columns maybe. And there's just uh, information about the taxi rides in uh, New York in 2016. And then you can also, for example, run a simple query here. I'm just doing like accounts to know how many tuples are there. And we have um, about 10 million tuples on this data set. All right, so this function here is just to do a little bit of benchmarking. Coming from academia, we do have to do something that's kind of fair, I guess. So I run just five times and take the, the median time of everything. And then this is actually where our demo starts. So we start off with a data frame. So pandas can also read parquet files. And the whole thing about DuckDB, again, is that it's not here as a replacement for pandas. This is not what I'm trying to sell, but something that can work together with pandas. So the, the cool thing is that we can, again, read and output data frames without any extra cost. So let's say that in the square here, we're just getting the passenger counts, then the average trip, trip, trip amount of uh, trips that had a short distance, right? And we, and we group by passengers, by the number of passengers. So what we want to know is, for short trips, does the amount of uh, tip uh, matters by the number of passengers in that ride? Um, and what you can see here is that you can, again, read from the data frame. That's what we're doing. And we just have to use the data frame name in our uh, SQL query. And if you call .df from the query results, you're also outputting a data frame. And it's pretty cool because the data frames have this uh, plot bar. So they have plotting capabilities that DuckDB doesn't have. And you can get easily a very nice chart. Uh, so you see here, apparently, um, there's some uh, dirty data because people are getting tips when they don't have anyone in their rights. Not sure what that is. But apparently, like, if you have more people, seven to nine, maybe like the more expensive cars, you get a higher tip. And you can do the same thing in Pandas, of course, right? Like, so in Pandas, you don't have SQL. You're going to have to do, to use their own language, to do the group by, the average, and you can directly use the plots. And the whole point here is to show the different execution time. Like, now we're waiting. OK, so it took a second. And DuckDB took 0 0.2. So this is like a 5x, right? 0 0.25, so like 4x. And you, you also have to consider that we're using like a, not a very beefy machine, right? This is a collab machine. Imagine if you had more cores. Uh, this difference would also be bigger. And then I added Spark for fun. Uh, so I actually, Spark can also read data frames. Uh, but it crashes out of memory in my collab machine. So I had to give up on that and read directly from Parquet files. But it does output it as a, as a data frame. I think we're going to have to wait a little bit. But as me, it's best. <laughs> so of course, Spark is not uh, designed for small data sets. But turns out there are a lot of use cases where you use these small data sets. That's still going. It's warming up a little bit. It's good for the winter. It produces some energy, I think. <laughs> All right, OK. So it took uh, two seconds, 2.2 seconds, um, the actual execution. And that's already like, what, more than two times what Pandas was. So yeah. Uh, anyway, for the demo, of course, like I, I showed you something that's fairly simple. Can you do actually very complicated things? Maybe not very complicated, but more complicated. So here, I'm not really going to go over the query. But the whole idea is that we can just, like, for example, use DuckDB to run a linear regression, right? So can we predict, can we estimate the fare uh, with, the, with the trip distance? And it turns out you can just get, calculate the alpha and beta with uh, not such a crazy query, right? And then you can, again, export it to pandas. And you have a very nice figure there. So you can really combine these tools uh, to get the best out of both. Um, all right, that was a demo. Summary. Oh, that's my last slide. Good. Uh, so yeah, DuckDB is an embedded database system. Again, it's completely open source. It is uh, under the MIT license. Since I came from academia, this is something that we were always worried about. It's to also give it back to everyone, because it was initially funded by uh, taxpayers' money, so everyone can use it. 100% of what we do is actually open source. There's nothing that's closed source. Um, it's designed for uh, analytical queries, so data analysis, uh, data science. Uh, has binding for many languages. So of course, I'm at the Python dev room. 
I'm talking about Python. But um, we have uh, R, Java. Turns out that Java is like one of our most downloaded APIs. So uh, I, I guess that's an interesting sign. Uh, <laughs> JavaScript and a bunch of others. It has very tight integrations with the Python ecosystem. Again, the whole idea is that you eliminate transfer costs, uh, implements the database in relational APIs. The relational API, again, is this more uh, data frame uh, like, and has full SQL support. So you, anything you can imagine, like window functions or whatnot, uh, you can just express them using DuckDB. Uh, and that's it. Uh, thank you very much for uh, paying attention. Uh, and, yeah. Happy to answer questions. <laughs> Thank you, Pedro. So we have five minutes for questions. Yeah. Oops. Sorry. Uh, you mentioned thanks. You thanks for the great presentation. Uh, you mentioned uh, beyond memory execution, and degrade kind of that it tries not to degrade as much. Can you shine a little bit more light on kind of what happens under the hood and how much degra degradation yeah, um, happens? Yeah, uh, of course. I, I think that's. There's only the ordering operator that actually does that. We have Lawrence uh, that, that's doing his PhD, so there's a lot of operators that need to research uh, to be developed. That, that's more of a goal than something that actually uh, happens now, but the whole goal is that you really don't have this sudden spike in the future. But there's research going on. Uh, in the future, there will be more to be shared for sure. Thank you very much for the talk, and uh, it's very exciting to see uh, uh, such a tool, such a powerful tool. Um, I'm working usually with data, data warehouses, and I saw on the website that you dis do not recommend using this with data warehouses. Is it? I, I would like to know why. Uh, uh, so, of course, uh, there's no one solution for our problems, right? There are cases that data warehouses are, are very good fits. Uh, it turns out that for data science, for example, which is kind of what we preach the most, uh, they're usually not good because then you fall back to the sending your data outside your database system, right? Like you're not really going to be running your Python codes inside the system. You can do that for UDS, for example, but they are messy, they're a bit nasty. So you want really to have it embedded in your Python process so you completely eliminate the data transfer costs. Because usually what you do is like, okay, I have a table, 10 columns, I'm going over four columns, but I'm really hitting, reading like huge chunks of it. So that's a bottleneck we try to eliminate. How do you handle updates? Uh, how do you handle updates? Yeah, uh, although we are an analytical database system, we do do updates. Uh, so Mark, I don't know where he is, but he's, uh, he's there. He developed an uh, MVCC algorithm for uh, OLAP. So we have the uh, same uh, asset transactional capabilities that you would expect from a transactional database. Of course, uh, if you have a transactional workload, you should still go for like, Postgres or SQLite or a database that handles this type of transactions. Uh, but Mark has developed like, a, a full-on algorithm to handle updates completely. Yeah? How do you compare to Vertica? How do we compare to Vertica? Uh, oh, good question. I think in terms of analytical queries, uh, TPCA is probably similar performance. Uh, but then again, the whole point is that if you go again for the Python process, the data transfer costs will take most of the time there. And then it's really catered for this type of scenario, the embedded scenario. We have one minute left for uh, one more question. Ah, yeah, uh, the, the, I actually have a repo uh, somewhere for a bunch of examples as well. I'm very happy to share it. Uh, I don't know where I'll post it. Ah, the, the frozen thing, I guess. All right. All right, thank you a lot, Pedro. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much.